Hello, and welcome to Liberty Forum 2014. My name is Carrie DePhillips, and I am so excited to be introducing Karen Strong. Uh, she is going to be giving a speech entitled Feminism, Socialism, and Panties. And who doesn't love that title, right? That's a, uh, a few people really? didn't, didn't love it, yeah. Yeah, quite a few. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> all right, well. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. It really is. So, <laughs> Karen Strawn, also known by the nom de net, Girl Writes What, is a divorced mother of two sons and a daughter, and a lifelong non-feminist. Over the last several years, and after much investigation, she's identified not only as a feminist critic, but as a staunch anti-feminist. Despite her lack of a university degree, her visual media material has been featured in high school, university, and college social science and psychology classrooms in the United States, Canada, and the UK. And she's one of the leading voices of the men's movement. Woo! Yes. So men! Let's go, guys. All right. When she's not harrying feminist, she can be found doing some home renovations. Yes. yes. Home Depot? Unfortunately, yes. Home Depot or Lowe's? A uh, Home Depot. Okay. Yeah. I, there you go. Right. for the Home there Depot. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, she can be found doing home renovations from Home Depot, uh, avoiding daily housework, and yeah. working a run-of-the-mill job. She has been speaking out fearlessly on gender issues since 2010. And without further ado, here, here she is. All right. Okay, can everyone hear me? Is my mic? Oh, stop. It's not on. Uh, it, it, is it on now? How about now? All right. You, sorry? You, you can hear it. That's all that matters. All right. Okay, just uh, wanting to thank the Free State Project for uh, inviting me to talk here, and uh, thanks to all of you, uh, especially those who aren't familiar with uh, what I do, for keeping an open mind, I hope. And uh, I understand from the Facebook announcement of this event that a lot of people did take offense at the name, the title of this talk, and I really understand why they would. Um, I just want to say I provided the organizers about a half dozen possible titles and they seem to have settled on the most controversial one. Um, other people uh, commenting in the Facebook thread expressed outrage at the very idea of anti-feminism. Uh, they seem to think that anti-feminism is some kind of objection to the idea of strong women. And another accused me of being a wealthy, educated, bourgeois white woman. Yay! Um, <laughs> Before I start, I'm going to clear up some of those misconceptions. I am not, in fact, wealthy or even formally educated. I am working class from a solid working class background. And I'm also not opposed in any way, shape, or form to the idea of a strong woman. Uh, my grandmother kicked butt and took names in her day at home and at a full-time job as postmistress of her town. And she would be rolling over in her grave if she thought that I believed that. So why am I an anti-feminist? Uh, first and foremost, it's because I believe feminism as an ideology, a political movement, and a branch of academia is misguided at best, dishonest at worst. Uh, whatever the case may be, whether it's maybe some of column A and a little of column B, scholarly and political feminism has shown a consistent imperviousness to facts and empiricism. Secondly, it's because feminism's influence on law and public policy has caused a huge amount of damage to men, children, and even women, uh, you know, almost entirely in the service of imposing a unilateral collective blame on men for the world's problems, especially women's problems. And it's generated and exacerbated a conflict between the sexes that simply never needed to exist. Some of you might be asking, what's an anti-feminist doing speaking at a libertarian forum? You know, what does gender politics have to do with libertarian philosophies? And the answer to that question is kind of complex. Uh, for one, gender influences everything, including the size, scope, and decisions of government. On the micro scale, gender affects the way men and women think, how they feel, how they process their interactions with the world, what motivates them, what influences them, what's important to them, and what incentives are going to affect their behavior and how they will be affected. And 
it affects how we perceive other people depending on whether they're a man or a woman. It impacts what we feel is appropriate uh, regarding the behaviors, responsibilities, and roles we expect of others and what we feel is appropriate for ourselves. On the macro scale, gender affects the way society feels about people depending on whether they're male or female, what expectations society has on them, of them, and what obligations society is prepared to place on them. It influences whose voices are going to be trusted on what issues and in what situations, and it affects society's willingness to punish or forgive. Whose society is interested in holding responsible and accountable for wrongs done? Whose society is prepared to devote resources to help and protect, and whose society is prepared to cut loose? So, gender is a kind of shortcut people, societies, and governments use when they're sorting priorities who's deserving of help, protection, and support, socially, legally, and governmentally, and who's less deserving or not deserving at all. Uh, how should that help be implemented? How should it not? How much are we willing to spend? How much institutional power is government going to have to uh, influence the lives and involve itself in the lives of its citizens to provide that help, support, and protection? And these prejudices are so deeply instilled in most of us they skew the way we see everything. We're seeing things through a warped lens, but we're so used to it, we don't even see the distortion. And while much of this distortion is cultural in origin, recent research in neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and psychology suggests that these prejudices are, at least to a significant degree, part of our human biological heritage, which is probably why it feels so natural to us. And while feminist, feminism claims to have worked really hard to dismantle all of these individual and society-wide assumptions about men and women, if you scratch the surface of their ideologies and their efforts, what you will find is all of those assumptions dialed up to 11. Um, not only has feminist activism manipulated and exploited all of these age-old perceptions about gender for political, legal, economic, and social gain, it's only amplified them within the culture. It's very much a case of say hello to the new boss, even more sexist than the old boss. As for why I'm here hoping to convince libertarians to think about feminism from a different angle, uh, as well as being more open-minded than most people, uh, and even might I say skeptical and contrarian regarding the status quo, libertarianism is not just about individual liberties. It's also about individual responsibilities, and more than a few libertarian-leaning people that I know have wised up on their own to feminism's habit of lobbying for ever more rights and freedoms for women while simultaneously attempting to divest women of the co-requisites, responsibility and accountability. While some self-identified feminists may indeed consider themselves libertarians, and they might even be genuinely so, the foundation of feminist thought is Marxist in nature. And just as Marxism long ago gave up, the idea of a full, gave up on the idea of a full-bore revolution in favor of a more subtle approach called cultural Marxism, feminism has employed this technique to gradually colonize all institutions in our society while never, ever having to lift up a single pitchfork. I'm not going to bore you with a detailed history of the marriage of feminism and Marxism. For that, I will quote feminist Catherine McKinnon who said, feminism, socialism, and communism are one and the same. Socialist communist government is the goal of feminism. I'll also refer any who are interested to a lengthy but fascinating lecture by Soviet expatriate Valdas Analaskas, who describes a courtship between Marxism and feminism that began in the mid-1800s. And I will note as well that the rhetoric about women's position in society expressed in the Declaration of Sentiments from Seneca Falls in the 1850s mirrored almost exactly that expressed in the writings of many communists of that era. The only significant difference was that it was men rather than the wealthy elites who were cast at the, as the universal villain. It is a Marxist rhetoric of class oppression in which women are the proletariat exploited and subjugated by their fathers, husbands, brothers, and even sons, the way workers were allegedly exploited by the bourgeoisie. The entire conceptual model of the patriarchy is simply Marxism repurposed and applied to the relationship between the sexes. Men collectively as a class oppress women collectively as a class. 
The intellectual backlash against feminism that began within the Marxist community around the turn of the 20th century with E. Belfort Bax and Robert Brefault, whose observations and grievances regarding feminism are still relevant and applicable today, was quashed through intimidation, censorship, and the skillful use of emotionally charged propaganda. Bax himself seemed bemused by the power of women within Marxism to convince people that up was actually down. For instance, that women were more harshly treated by the criminal justice system when all available empirical data demonstrated the exact opposite. Then again, humans have always been more emotionally reactive to in harms, injuries, injustices, complaints, and perils affecting women, more likely to see women as nurturing, benign, kind, well-meaning, and deserving of protection. We have always been more likely to see men as strong, sturdy, capable of self-sufficiency, potent, and potentially threatening. And these perceptions inform our reactions when men suffer harms, injuries, injustices, and dangers, and when they dare to complain about them. Because of these near universal perceptions of gender, when feminists pointed up at the top of society and showed us mostly men, we did not bother to direct our attention down to the bottom of society and see the mostly men there as well. We all saw a glass ceiling, but not a glass cellar, and that allowed feminists to convince us that all aspects of society, the formalized and the informal, were male-dominated, male-controlled, and that women as a class were essentially powerless and subjugated under this system. We were told that men in power acted primarily for the benefit of men, and that women were treated as second-class citizens rather than different citizens. We were told about the harms men do and the harms women endure and accepted half the tale as the entire story. By the 1960s, when communist thought had become confined to a small pocket of what the mainstream mostly thought of as misguided weirdos, feminist thought, slapped together from the exact same bricks and mortar, became not only fashionable, but had spawned its own branches of academia and, you know, sponsored and, unwitt and, and unwittingly enabled by governments, democratic governments across the West. Most of the models scholarly feminists developed and expanded on, the patriarchy and its sub-theories, are little more than post hoc rationalizations based on emotional reasoning, seriously questionable data gathering, and outright falsehoods, but easily swallowed by the well-meaning public because of the evidence that stands out most starkly to us given our natural evolved views of gender. But consider. Theodore Roosevelt's 1904 campaign to revive the whipping post as a punishment specifically for men who beat their wives. He claimed that such men were repugnant to any right-thinking person and 30 lashes would not cause hunger or want to a woman the way imprisoning or fining the husband would. Contrast that with what feminists of the second wave told us about domestic violence against women being considered socially acceptable until they came along to show us all the light. Contrast it again with the axiomatic assumption required to consider the patriarchy a valid model that men in power will act primarily for men's benefit to the detriment of women. Still, a lot of people believed their claims. Under second wave feminism, family was reinterpreted as an institution based on exploitation. Instead of all members working together for the benefit and shared success of all members, women were recast as powerless subordinates providing unreciprocated labor toward the raising of his children and the keeping of his house, never hers in any context. Uh, labor that freed him, freed him to pursue economic and social power outside the home. It didn't matter that most men throughout history had little more access to economic and social power than most women, or that what power men achieved they were expected to share equitably with their families, Feminists were too busy pointing upwards uh, at the congressmen, bank managers, and CEOs and crying injustice to show us the taxi drivers, garbage men, plumbers, loggers, fishermen, miners, construction workers, factory laborers, field workers, roughnecks, and janitors. They envied the power of history's generals and statesmen, but spared little thought for history's thousands of young foot soldiers dead in trenches. They were jealous of the self-determination that made an industrialist rich beyond dreaming, but when that same self-determination produced a different outcome for history's mostly male population of tramps, beggars, and hobos, uh, that was invisible to them. They focused obsessively on the men above who dominated the top 1% of society and didn't even notice the men in the bottom 30. 
The 23 cent average apples to oranges annual wage gap is still in their minds the height of sexist injustice, but the greater than 93% workplace death gap, meh, who cares? Traditional ways of providing for and protecting women that were absolutely necessary in the pre-industrial past were reinterpreted by feminism as male oppressors keeping women down all through history for men's benefit. Domestic violence, a social problem that has always been gender symmetrical, became synonymous with violence against women. A husband's historical right to conjugal relations with his wife was redefined as marital rape, while a wife's historical identical right, one that for centuries if denied was legal grounds for divorce and could even get a man excommunicated from his church, that part of history was quietly erased from modern scholarship. And uh, as an interesting side note, a few years ago a man in France was ordered by a judge to pay his ex-wife over $10,000 in punitive damages because he didn't give her enough sex during their marriage. Can any of you imagine the media outcry had a man even attempted to sue his ex-wife for not putting out enough for his liking while they were married? Can you imagine the code red apoplectic spittle flecked level of moral outrage that would have accompanied a verdict in his favor? <laughs> the traditional obligation of a woman to defer to her husband's authority was redefined as oppression. But her husband's obligation to die in a trench to protect his country and family, or the legally enforceable obligation that he provide for her and their children all the necess material necessities of life, that became male privilege. And when enough people protested the hubris of that assertion, it became patriarchy hurts men too. Under the patriarchy, all men are supposedly privileged by their maleness and all women oppressed by their femaleness. And, as, and if men are, as a class, the privileged bourgeoisie, if men hold collective power over society, then all men are culpable for the oppression and exploitation of all women. That is how Marxist collectivism works. As far as radical feminists are concerned, the drastic technological and economic changes that occurred during the last century, medical advances that virtually eliminated deaths in childbirth and drastically reduced infant and child mortality rates, Ch changes that rendered the workplace as safe and comfortable as your living room, uh, safe and reliable birth control, industrialization, automation, prosperity, plenty and an unprecedented level of individual security, most of it brought to us by men, none of this had anything to do with the gains women have more recently made. It can't have, because women were historically kept from succeeding in a man's world, not by biological reality, not by the difficult and harsh nature of the environment men frequently had to operate in, not by circumstance, but by male oppression. Even prior to all those changes, during a history in which a woman might spend half her adult life pregnant or nursing children, where most labor was grueling, dangerous, and simply beyond the physical capabilities of women, where life was often brutal and brief, and where men bore a legally enforceable obligation to provide for the material needs of all female family members. The fact that men bore the economic authority as well as the economic burdens of a family was defined as a system specifically designed to disempower women. According to the most radical feminists, your grandfathers and great-grandfathers were rapists and slave masters who exploited, subjugated, and violated the women who were nearest and dearest to them, their own mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters. According to them, under a patriarchy, all heterosexual sex is rape because women as a class don't have the collective political power to be on an even footing with men, and therefore any consent a woman might give is given under duress. Using the model of patriarchy, every atrocity ever committed throughout all of history can be laid at the door of normalized masculinity. But every male-generated advance, calculus, alternating current, the telegraph, the transistor, radio, penicillin, the number system, hydroelectricity, microwaves, fiberglass, the theory of relativity, the periodic table, trigonometry, insulin, canned foods, vaccines, fire retardants, Teflon, wireless communications, the microchip, the birth control pill, and even tampons, is a result of men intentionally holding women back keeping women down, refusing to allow women to achieve, and hogging all the power and the glory. You see how all that works. All the great evils of history, admittedly committed mostly by men, are evidence of men's oppressive natures. And all the great advances of civilization, because they were almost exclusively generated by men, are equally evidence of men's oppressive natures. 
even the exceptional and wonderful things men have achieved and continue to achieve that have benefited all of us are not evidence that men embody anything good. In fact, they demonstrate the opposite, that women would have achieved such things if only men had not enslaved and oppressed them. This is what they believe. If it isn't, they're suffering from some serious cognitive dissonance because the belief that the patriarchy exists as an unjust, unjust top-down sister of gender enforcement that oppresses women and privileges men kind of requires it. And patriarchy is the foundation of ideological feminism. I have even come across feminists who claim that women's experience through history is identical to the experience of blacks under slavery. But consider this, if women were truly oppressed by the patriarchy, would they have been spared the most onerous and dangerous tasks simply because they were less physically capable? Or would men have simply assigned more women to do them? If women were truly oppressed by the patriarchy, would said patriarchy have written provisions into its slave codes that provided protections and exemptions for female slaves that did not exist for male ones? I'm 100% sure that enforcement of those codes and provisions kind of left a lot to be desired, but it at least reflected a social consensus that women specifically should not have to suffer abuse. Does anyone here think that women who were a tiny minority, tenths of a percent among the 10 million military personnel who died during World War I, derived no benefit from the traditional system? Heck, one of the few ways a man could avoid conscri uh, conscription was to be married. Simply put, a man could avoid mandatory military service if his wife would be inconvenienced by it. And yet this system existed to benefit men at the expense of women. A system of top-down oppression, according to many feminists, that is no different from the experience of blacks under slavery. If one does perceive the history of gender relations as being remotely like that, it's perfectly understandable that a feminist like Robin Morgan, former editor of Ms. Magazine, would claim Man-hating is an honorable and viable political act. The oppressed have a right to class hatred against the class that is oppressing them. Yet as simple and childish and absurd as this model is, it wasn't long before it had become firmly entrenched in academia, in the humanities and the arts, in sociology, anthropology, political science, the law, psychology, history, women's studies, and gender studies. The very faculties and programs associated with education, social work, journalism, criminal and family law, and governance. The very branches of society most able to influence public opinion and perception and government policy. And because of all those things I was talking about at the very start of this presentation, public perception was vulnerable to the half-truths presented to it disguised as the entire picture. And the really awesome thing about this model is that as long as enough people believe it, even just a little, as long as enough people can be convinced to see men as the bourgeoisie who have always unjustly benefited from their exploitation of women, and women as the proletariat who have always been forced to toil and slave without benefit under the boot heel of those privileged men, you can justify anything. It becomes acceptable, justifiable, and appropriate for women to expropriate men's undeserved and unearned power, wealth, and privilege by any means necessary, including state coercion. And this attitude is not just confined to family law, domestic violence law, and sexual assault law, the primary areas where men's interests will come into conflict with women's and where feminist lobbyists in the state have been quietly at work eroding due process protections and equal treatment under the law and building bloated and ravenous mechanisms that suck up dollars and power while curtailing civil liberties. It's everywhere. It informs economic and employment policy, health spending, education policy, criminal law, the whole shebang. Think about the life of Julia. I'm sure you guys must be familiar with it. One of Obama's most naked and blatant appeals to young single women. Julia has no father and no husband. She needs neither. The state will take care of her needs from birth to death and will support her when she decides to have a child of her own, a child that in Obama's narrative is also fatherless. The man in Julia's life, the one who will perform the roles, provision, protection, and support, historically performed by husbands, brothers, and fathers, is more powerful than any man she'll ever meet, more able to provide for her, and one she need make no compromises with. 
Julia will never have to pick up this man's dirty socks or put up with him snoring or farting in bed or consider his needs or provide him with love, respect and affection. He is the ultimate provider and the ultimate protector and all he will ask of her in return is her vote. And he'll give her all those benefits through a system that coerces net taxpayers and net tax generators of whom a disproportionate number are men to surrender their productivity while offering them neither mutual benefit nor voluntary association in return. This feels right and just to feminists because the state is merely assisting Julia in stealing back all the opportunities that were wrongfully taken from women as a class by men as a class. This feels like a great deal for Julia since all she's done is replace a man with whom she would have to bargain freely with a state that provides her all the same benefits without the messy business of having to trade anything valuable for them. If women like Julia can be said to be married to the state, in a very real sense, men are married to it as well, and the obligations expected of them are the same as they always have been. In this marriage, men pay at least 75% of the tax revenue into the system and reap a disproportionately tiny percentage of its protections and benefits. In this marriage, the state enforces the obligations of husbandhood after divorce and the obligations of fatherhood even when men did not consent to become fathers and even when they are allowed no meaningful role in the lives of their children. The state is essentially forcing men to finance a system that disenfranchises them. And the state is essentially paying women to disenfranchise men. Social responsibility is enforced on men through the penalty of imprisonment while for women, social irresponsibility means a check in the mail every month. A lot of people have wondered out loud why there aren't more female libertarians. If there's a reason, maybe it lies in a lack of incentive. Big government costs the vast majority of men, their wealth, their civil liberties, their autonomy, sometimes their freedom. But for many women, big government represents an insurance policy and a perpetual subsidy of their personal choices, good or bad. Men pay the premiums into the plan and women receive the benefits. What used to be a voluntarily accepted obligation on the part of men, one which provided them with reciprocal benefits, is now extracted from them at the point of a gun, and often there is no way for them, no matter how well they comply, to avoid being shot. One example of what men's tax dollars disproportionately support and which lies in direct opposition to their own interests and rights would be the institutionalization of the Duluth model of domestic violence. This model is the feminist conceptual framework of family violence. According to Duluth, family violence is overwhelmingly male perpetrated and is motivated by men's and women's relative political positions in society, by male social and political dominance and the cultural expectation of female subordination. A man who batters his wife is not just asserting dominance over her, he is expressing normalized masculinity. Abuse and coercive control of a woman, according to this model, is not a pathology, but a natural function of male identity within a patriarchal culture. Simply put, it's just what men do. Every piece of legislation, every government policy, and every publicly funded treatment program in the US regarding family violence, and the vast majority of them worldwide, in, are informed by this conceptual model. And that would be fine if it wasn't a load of BS as hundreds of studies and surveys from the most modern Western democracies to countries like Jordan and Namibia demonstrate in at least half of cases partner violence is reciprocal. It involves men and women hitting each other and what motivates them is pretty much the same. Anger, poor conflict resolution skills, jealousy, a desire to control or discipline a partner, uh, drug and alcohol problems, mental illness, and external stressors such as poverty. Women are as likely to, as men to report hitting their partners for all these reasons and are actually slightly more likely to engage in coercive control of a partner. More than that, women are actually more likely to be the partner to initiate physical violence. And in cases of severe unilateral violence against a non-violent partner, women are the perpetrators up to 70% of the time. Prevalence of domestic violence in lesbian partnerships is actually slightly higher than it is in heterosexual ones. What all this means is that patriarchal terrorism, the Duluth model of intimate partner violence, is the most rare form of all. And yet the patriarchal terrorism paradigm informs all of our government-funded mechanisms for intervention and treatment. And it doesn't even end there. Women are the most likely demographic to perpetrate child abuse and neglect, even controlling for hours the number of hours spent with children. 
and the majority of young children murdered are murdered by their mothers. Biological fathers are, in contrast, less likely than both biological mothers and stepfathers to perpetrate child abuse. Statistically, the environment in which a woman is most safe from violence is in a stable marriage, and the environment in which children are the most safe from violence is one in which their parents are raising them in a stable, intact family. Yet our entire system of family law and our entire response to domestic violence, from the VAWA to local police department policies, is designed to encourage and facilitate divorce, to favor sole maternal custody arrangements, and to protect children from the very people least likely to abuse them. Domestic violence programs that encourage or even permit couples counseling do not qualify for federal funding, despite the fact that credible research shows that in a substantial portion of cases, uh, conflict and violence between partners de-escalates over time. And despite the fact that a disproportionate amount of severe violence occurs during family breakup, particularly when one partner feels they are going to lose everything that's important to them, you know, stuff like access to their kids. And it's not like feminist groups haven't been exposed to evidence of this, even if they were unaware of those hundreds of surveys and studies. In the 1980s, these groups convinced, uh, convinced that hundreds of men were getting away with beating their wives, persuaded police departments across the US to implement mandatory arrest policies. In California, these policies led to a 37% increase in arrests of men and a 446% increase in arrests of women, which leads one to wonder who'd been getting away with it the whole time. In response, feminists went on to convince police departments across the U.S. to implement predominant aggressor policies. Now, when police are called to a domestic dispute, they must consider things like relative height, weight, and strength, which partner seems more distressed, almost always the woman, and current approved models of domestic violence treatment, that is, Duluth, before deciding who to arrest. And low arrest rates went all the way back to normal, 85 to 90% men, at least a third of whom would be victims. They will then routinely turn around and cite criminal statistics to justify their continued focus on male perpetration and female victims. And funnily enough, in many jurisdictions, any deviation from the desirable ratio of arrests will result in investigation into possible gender bias. You heard me. If a given jurisdiction shows arrests of women exceed 20% of all arrests, they are vulnerable to official accusations of sexism. Divorce lawyers have called all of this part of the gamesmanship of divorce, a method by which a spouse, most often the wife, can secure automatic custody of both the children and the marital home and leave an ex-partner scrambling to defend himself, often without access to necessary documents or even a change of clothes. The average time, length of time it takes a woman to obtain a temporary restraining order in an ex parte hearing is under three minutes. In many jurisdictions, she need provide no evidence of prior abuse only tell the judge that she's scared of her husband. The first any man might hear that such an order has been issued is when the police arrive to remove him from his home. This is a massive wealth redistribution scheme, right? This is funneling money into the courts. It's funneling money up into the government. It's funneling money away from families, right? A divorce never resulted in financial benefit for any family member, ever. Okay, uh, is it any wonder that in the immediate wake of a family breakup, men are 10 to 11 times more likely to commit suicide than women are? These are some of the influences of politicized ideological feminism in the areas of domestic violence and family law. And while society has always placed a greater priority on protecting women than men from violence and abuse, feminists have managed to rewrite a lot of history and manipulate our instinctive perception of the sexes in order to justify ever more intrusive government, government mechanisms that protect women from even their own criminal behavior and curtail the rights and civil liberties of men who find themselves at the mercy of the system after having done nothing wrong. Over the last 40 years, a growing number of researchers have challenged feminism's theory of gender conflict and the conceptual framework of Duluth. According to Dr. Murray Strauss, former president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems and a respected family violence researcher, quote, I suggest that one of the explanations for denying the evidence on gender symmetry is to defend feminism in general, end quote. He elaborates further. The removal of patriarchy as the main cause of partner violence weakens a dramatic example of the harmful effects of patriarchy. 
In other words, feminists have been using partner violence as a primary evidentiary pil pillar and to validate the, and augment their class conflict model of the patriarchy. Evidence that women abuse men as often as men abuse women and for all the same reasons significantly weakens this argument and throws their entire worldview into question. Researchers like Strauss have been subjected to blacklisting, career sabotage, intimidation, professional shunning, and even death and bomb threats. Family violence researcher Suzanne Steinmetz had a bomb threat called into her daughter's wedding and was subject to a letter writing campaign aimed at denying her promotion and tenure at the University of Delaware. Strauss himself has been publicly slandered with accusations of beating his wife and had the first few rows of the audience of his presidential address get up and walk out when he began his speech, which wasn't even about partner violence. It was about the damages of spanking your children. Erin Pitsey, the woman who established the world's first battered women's refuge in the UK, lived for years under police protection due to threats against herself, her children, and her grandchildren, and finally fled the UK after her family dog was shot and after the police had ordered to her to have all her mail redirected to the bomb unit. All for daring to say that women are as violent as men in their relationships and that partner abuse is not a natural function of masculine identity within any culture, patriarchal or otherwise, but a gender-neutral social problem primarily caused by experiencing or witnessing abuse during childhood. To prove women are not violent, feminists have engaged in campaigns of intimidation, violence, and threats. And they see no irony in any of that. The fiscal, social, and human costs of these policies are staggering. We treat every domestic violence accusation, indeed even the hint that a woman is afraid of her partner, with a better safe than sorry strategy that engages multiple bureaucracies. Taxpayers and beleaguered men pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for investigations, assessments, psychiatric evaluations, lawyers, expensive legal proceedings, incarcerations and prosecutions, a growing number of which end with the discovery that it was a trivial incident or the woman was lying for revenge or personal gain. Children end up mercilessly fragged by combative mothers and they're deprived, often permanently, of what may be their only stable parent. Fathers are ground into the dust. Intervention programs run by government-funded agencies apply a single ideologically poisoned treatment to a multifaceted problem, curing citizens of diseases they don't have while allowing their actual problems to fester untreated. Cumbersome legal procedures, no-drop policies, predominant aggressor policies, institutional legal and informal biases all contribute to a bill that is increasingly impossible for taxpayers to afford and that is handicapping the ability of our children, those future taxpayers who are going to be stuck with it to effectively shoulder the debt. Fatherless children, an epidemic of whom we are creating with these policies, are more prone to a whole host of social maladies. They are at two to up to 32 times the risk of being physically or sexually abused, becoming teenage parents, dropping out of school, being behaviorally disordered, uh, becoming involved in gangs, being addicted to drugs or alcohol, being expelled from school, committing suicide, not going to college, committing crimes, being incarcerated, requiring welfare or food stamps, and uh, contracting sexually transmitted diseases, and becoming victims of violence. In fact, if you control for fatherlessness, the race disparity in the U.S. prison population all but vanishes. If we are expecting our children to bail us out of this fiscal and human mess we are creating, we are in for a nasty surprise because they aren't going to be able to do it. This is a problem of snowballing costs that will only worsen with each generation as governments get more bloated and top-heavy to implement all of them and enforce all of them while simultaneously crippling the ability of future generations to support it. It is a system where we examine the reading scores of eight-year-old boys not to determine how best to help boys stop falling behind in education, but to determine how many prisons we're going to need in 30 years. Okay? It is a system wherein a man who is laid off and temporarily unable to pay his child support is systematically stripped of his driver's license, his professional licenses, and then thrown in debtor's prison to the tune of $60,000 of taxpayer money every year, saddled with a criminal record that renders him permanently unable to pay his child support. You know, we are literally metaphorically sh you know, chopping his arms off and then telling him to shovel for all he's worth or he's going to be sorry. And behind all of this, you will find radical feminist lobbyists pushing for further reforms for women to undo millennia of oppression of women that never actually existed the way they think it did. 
and regardless of the collateral damage to other members of society, including their own children. They do this in the name of liberating women from the oppression of their historical and reciprocal dependence on men by constructing enormous government bureaucracies ever growing in power and scope, funded disproportionately by men, and upon which women in general have become just as dependent as they ever were on any man. All for the purpose of ending oppression, because as I know you guys all believe, no government ever, anywhere ever oppressed anybody. So, that's it. Any questions? Hmm? One question, only one? All right, who's the lucky person? All right, go ahead, you were first. Um, I just want to say first, thank you so much for giving this talk. Um, I'm a, a father, and uh, I I went through uh, literally like the court system. I count. I had 12 times I had to go to court one year, um, and uh, after about uh, uh, probably 20, 30 times being in the the court system, all simply because I. I have a, uh, a daughter who's beautiful and amazing, but uh, apparently in Massachusetts, it's treated as a crime. Um, I talked with uh, someone in, in one of my times there uh, who uh, had basically been thrown in prison for 30 days, and he was in court because the mother of his child was trying to put him back in prison for not paying child support while he was in prison. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, um, no, it's 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 insane. It's it's and 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 I just I can't even begin to see what tell you what like you people what a traumatic thing this is, uh, uh, and I don't even know how to describe it. I don't even know how to turn this into a question. Uh, but let me just stop rambling and say uh, thank you, and and maybe how do we solve this problem? <laughs> I, I, do you know how to solve the problem? Kind of. Okay, go ahead. Mike. 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 Run. Well, I am, I'm Christine Bonser. Hello. I really like men. I have brothers. And you're really the first woman that I've ever seen speak about this in public. And we're rare. <laughs> yeah, and I think. I'm, I got to hang out with you really late last night yeah. and talk on Skype with your boyfriend and, and it was neat and I'm just sort of telling the story. So I think that we can solve it by more of this. Yeah. Educating women and men because it's jaw dropping. I it, helped it, a, a it friend is, yeah. who got pregnant with and it got crazy and went to the court system and he had no chance. Absolutely zero chance and he finally gave up custody to his child because it was causing his child so much pain and and he had to walk away in order for yeah. her life to be good so yeah. do you have a book do you have a website i do, do will you I, accept questions through email if oh, we can't yeah, get yeah. them all in yeah and what no, are I, those things please? i i have a youtube channel under my real name uh, karen strawn um i have a blog called owning your shit uh, I don't I don't post on that very much anymore because I've mostly uh, started doing videos rather than blog posts. Um, once I showed my face, there was no going back. Once I revealed my real name again, there was no going back from that. So, um, and uh, anybody who wants to email me, they can email me at girlrightswhat at gmail dot com. And uh, if, they, if they have any questions or anything like that, um, as far as uh, the staggering array of statistics. Um, there are a few websites. If you want me to direct you to them, I can find them and email them back to you uh, if you need, if you want sources and citations. Um, but I don't have them on me right now. So, um, can you repeat one more time the YouTube channel name? Uh, Karen Strong. Okay. Yeah. A U G H A N. Thank you. So. And yeah, I guess part of the solution will have to be women coming out and saying this stuff because nobody really takes men seriously when they do. They're just a whiny loser or they're an angry, bitter guy who probably deserved what he got. I mean, look at how angry he is. He seems just like an angry person. And the media does it as 
Well, like the father, oh, yeah. father with the diaper. Mm. The commercial oh, do you, did you rem do you remember that Obama Father's Day address where he was criticizing black fathers in America for not stepping up? And it's like you step up, for, you try to step up for your kids, and the the police come and take you away, right? Because you don't you're not allowed to have access, right? So it's ridiculous. Anyway, thank you very much, guys.